What's going on guys, my name is Matt, and last week I showed you a $550 gaming PC, talked in depth about each of the parts and why I picked them, and finally I showed you how it performed in some games. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to put this $550 gaming PC together step by step, and then show you some viewer requested benchmarks, including stuff like Apex Legends, Rust, Rainbow Six, and more. I will very briefly go over each part in this video, but again, for the full explanation of each part, go ahead and check out the original video first, which is linked in the description below. I tried to make this guide as in-depth as possible, showing you up close how to plug everything in, including those pesky front panel connectors, but before I get into this guide, first, here's a word from today's sponsor. This video is brought to you by Asus and their NVIDIA RTX powered graphics cards. Asus stands out from the rest because of their auto extreme process, which is 100% automated, unlike other companies who have parts of their cards made by hand. Automating the process takes human error out of the equation and results in lower failure rates and more reliable cards. Asus GeForce RTX cards like this sweet RTX 2060 are powered by NVIDIA's Turing architecture. This allows you to experience today's biggest games such as Minecraft RTX like never before with the visual fidelity of real-time ray tracing and the ultimate performance of AI-powered DLSS 2.0. These cards also come with NVIDIA's NVENC encoder, which is perfect for people wanting to get the most performance while streaming. Combining the precision of Auto Extreme manufacturing with RTX on enables one of the most reliable and visually immersive gaming experiences possible. Make sure to check the link in the description to learn more, and thanks again to Asus for sponsoring this video. With that done, let's get into how to build this $550 gaming beast. Before you get started, you are going to need a Phillips head screwdriver, an open area to work on, and an hour or two blocked off to complete this build. First thing you want to get out is your CPU box and your motherboard box. From the CPU box, remove the CPU clamshell and the black cooler box. This CPU is the quad core 8 thread Ryzen 3 3300X. It's probably the best value for the money gaming CPU, but you can use the Ryzen 3 3100 instead for very similar performance. From the motherboard box, remove the SATA cables, the IO shield that looks like this, and the board itself. Take the board out of the bag and place it on top of the box. This motherboard is the Gigabyte B450M DS3H. This is a micro ATX board that uses the B450 chipset, has all the features we need, and is a great value for the money. Now bring your attention to the CPU socket, which is located at the center of the motherboard. Press down and out, then lift up on the metal retention arm until it's perpendicular to the board. Open up the CPU clamshell and remove the CPU, handling it only by its edges. Line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. The Ryzen 3 text should also line up with the socket and vortex on the motherboard. Now lower it in, applying no pressure whatsoever, it should just slip into place. Once you're sure it's in, go ahead and lower the retention arm back down, making sure it clips into place. The next thing to do is install our cooler, but first you need to remove these four screws and remove these two pieces of plastic, leaving the back plate in place. Now get your CPU cooler box you got out earlier. This is the AMD Wraith Stealth Cooler, which comes included in the box with your Ryzen 3 CPU. It looks nice, performs well, and is free. Take the cooler with the Ryzen logo facing the I.O. or RAM sticks and lower it into place, lining up the cooler screws with the backplate standoffs. Now screw the cooler down a few turns at a time in a cross pattern. This ensures there's even pressure across the CPU IHS. With that tightened all the way down, you can optionally remove these four smaller screws. This allows you to lift up the fan assembly and rotate it so the AMD logo is facing up. Once aligned, just reinstall the four screws. Now take the CPU fan cable and locate the CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard. Line up the notch in the header and the connector and press it into place. You can now optionally neaten up the excess CPU fan cable. Now get out your two RAM sticks. These are Patriot XPG DIMMs with 16 gigabytes of total capacity. They run at 3000 megahertz CL16. On the motherboard, bring your attention to the four RAM slots. We're gonna be using slots two and four, which are the gray ones. Open the clips on both sides and get out the first stick. Line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once you're sure it's lowered incorrectly, push down on both sides until both clips snap shut. Now just take your second stick and repeat the process in the other gray slot. With that done, set your board to the side and grab out your case box. When getting it out, it's a lot easier to lift the box away from the case than it is to lift the case straight out of the box. This is the Cougar MG130. It's a micro ATX case with a tempered glass side panel. 
For around $50, this is a good deal and is relatively easy to build in. With the case out, unscrew the top and bottom back panel thumb screws and lift the panel away. Pull out this drive sled and remove the white box which contains all the screws needed to install your components. Now lay the case on its side and remove the four thumb screws holding on the glass panel. With the screws out, you can now hinge the glass panel from the bottom and lift it away. Take the foam, plastic, and both of the side panels and store them in the box while you're building. This gets them out of the way and in a safe place while you're building your PC. Now grab your IO shield, which you took out of the motherboard box earlier, hold it like this and lower it to the back IO cutout. Once lined up, push each corner to clip it into place. Once it's securely in, locate this hole and hand tighten one of these thumb screws into place. Now take your motherboard, handling it by the cooler and lower it into the case, lining up the IO with the IO shield and making sure you can see the standoffs through the motherboard holes. Next, get out six motherboard screws that look like this. Install one of these in each of the holes that has a standoff beneath it. Now you can lift the case back onto its feet and get out your power supply box. This is the EVGA 500BA. This is a 500 watt 80 plus gold unit that is non-modular but has all black sleeve cables and offers plenty of clean power to the entire system. Open up the bundle of wires and leave everything loose except for the Molex cable and one of the SATA cables. These last two can be rebundled and tied together because we won't be needing them and this gets them out of the way. Now with the fan facing down, insert the power supply like this and push it to the back of the case. Use the four screws that came with the power supply to secure it into the back of the case. For the SSD, I originally was going to be using one of these holders, but later decided not to, so you can loosen these, press in to unlock them, and lift them away. Next, remove one of the drive caddies at the back of the case and get out your SSD. This is a 256GB silicon power A55 SSD. It's a pretty basic drive, but still a great option to start out with. Like I said in the last video, you could optionally go for a 1TB 7200 RPM mechanical drive for more storage right out of the gate. Use four of the same types of screws we used for the motherboard to install the drive to this caddy. Putting the drive here and removing the SSD mounts at the front allows for more GPU airflow and more room for cables. Next get out one of the SATA cables from earlier and install one end into the SSD. You can now slide the drive into the cage it was removed from. We can now start routing cables. Take the 24 pin motherboard cable that looks like this and push it through here. Take the front panel connectors that look like this, the USB 3 cable that looks like this, and the PCIe power cable that looks like this and push them through this hole here. Next take the USB 2 cable that looks like this and the HD audio cable and push them through here. After that take the other end of the SATA data cable and push it through this hole here. Now take the 8 pin CPU cable and push it through this hole up here. With that done, you can lay the case onto its side to start plugging things in. Start by taking the large 24 pin connector and line up the clip on the connector with the notch on the header. Now press the 24 pin into place until it clips in. Next take the 8 pin CPU cable and again line the clip on the connector and the notch on the header and press it into place. Now we'll plug in all the small connectors working from the bottom left of the motherboard to the bottom right. Start by grabbing the HD audio cable and and finding the F audio header. Take the connector and press it down with the HD audio text facing the bottom of the case. Move to the right some and find both the USB block connector and the two USB headers. Take the block and plug it in with the text facing the top of the case into either of these two headers. Just to the right of that, grab the bulky USB 3 cable and line the notch in the header and the connector and press it into place. To the right of that is where the small front panel connectors go. Now start by taking the cable labeled power switch and plug it into these two pins here. Now directly to the left of that, plug in the power LED cables with the positive one to the left. Finally, take the reset switch and plug it in directly below the power switch. There's now only a few more cables to go. To the right of the front panel connectors, grab the SATA cable we routed earlier and plug it into one of the SATA ports. I plugged mine into the bottom most port. Now bring your attention from the bottom of the board to right here, which is in between the cooler and the IO where you'll take the back fan cable and plug it in the same way you did for the CPU fan. With all this done, it's now time to install our graphics card. Get out your card, which in this build is the Asus GTX 1650 Super. This is a great 1080p card that puts out a ton of performance for a pretty low price. 
At the back of the case, start by loosening up this bracket, sliding it up, and then tightening it back down. Now take the middle two PCIe slot covers and wiggle them back and forth until they snap off and remove them. Finally, before you install your card, you need to flip open this PCIe lock. Now take your card and lower it down, lining up the notch in the card with the notch in the slot. Once you're sure it's lowered down correctly, you can press down until the clip snaps shut. Now at the back of the case again, install one or two of these screws like this to secure the graphics card down. You can now slide the cover back down and tighten it into place. With that done, there's one more cable to plug in, which is the PCIe power cable. Take it and plug one of the six pin connectors into the card by lining up both notches and pressing it into place. With that done, all of the components are installed and there is just a few more steps. Next, you can cable manage your system by pulling all the excess cable link from the main chamber to the back of the case. Now you can use the included zip ties to neaten everything up and try to make things as flat as possible. Once you're happy with it, you can lay the case on its side and push down on the back panel while in installing the two thumb screws. Then finally you can remove the plastic from the glass panel and screw it into place. With that done, you're now ready to boot your system up for the first time, but there is still a few more things to do on the software side of things before you can hop into games. First thing is you need to install your OS, which more than likely will be Windows. I'm not going to go over how to do this in this video, but I'll leave a link to an in-depth guide on how to do this in the description. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Once done and in Windows, you need to install some drivers. Start by going to the motherboard page linked in the description. Click on support, then click on chipset and download the AMD chipset drivers. Once downloaded, open them up and install them. Next go to the NVIDIA page linked in the description, select GeForce, GTX 16 series, 1650 Super, your OS and then download. Once downloaded, install the graphics drivers. With this done, there is one more thing to do before you can jump into some games. With the PC off, turn it on, then immediately smash the delete key to enter into the BIOS. Go to this MIT tab, then select advanced memory settings. Next click Extreme Memory Profile, then finally Profile 1. You can now save changes and exit. With that done, you're now ready to download your games and enjoy them. So I hope that guide was helpful or at least entertaining to some of you guys out there. With the guide done, I'm now going to show you a bunch of viewer requested benchmarks. Starting with Apex Legends, I test at 1080p high settings. Doing this resulted in the system staying right around the 100 FPS mark. This was a very smooth and enjoyable experience. Also, this is the first time I've played Apex in months and I forgot how fun it is. Next up is Rust, which I put the settings to what I think is medium at 1080p and ran around. Doing this resulted in the FPS staying around the upper 80s most of the time. For Valorant, I test at 1080p medium and to no one's surprise, the system did great staying in the mid to upper 200s. In PUBG, I test at 1080p medium and the system overall averaged a little below 100 fps. There were some drops when in combat, but overall it was a great experience. In Rainbow Six, using the built-in benchmark at 1080p high settings, the system produced a 214 fps average, which is a pretty respectable score. Next up, I tested Fall Guys at 1080p max settings. I couldn't find a way to unlock the frame rate, but the system stayed at a lock 60 fps the entire time. Finally, in CSGO at 1080p low settings, the system stayed in the upper 200 most of the time and produced a very smooth gaming experience. As you can see, the system is a 1080p gaming beast. If you're interested, I'll have all the parts linked in the description. Definitely check out all the links because a lot of times Amazon and Newegg will have similar pricing, but a lot of times Newegg has more parts that are ready to ship compared to Amazon that has a lot of parts that are back ordered. I will also link the original video with in-depth part explanations and more benchmarks like COD Warzone. Overall, for $550, you're getting a very powerful system and using this guide should allow you to build it with relative ease. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. Thanks again to Asus for sponsoring this video. Like this video if you liked it, consider subscribing, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.